Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today, we're going to be talking about Chapter 12, which is all about poverty. A lot of this has already been reviewed since we've watched the documentary, Poverty, Inc. So, what is poverty? Poverty can be defined as a condition of deprivation due to economic circumstances that is severe enough that the individual cannot live with dignity in their society. The administration of Lyndon Johnson established a wide range of anti-poverty programs in the 1960s, including programs for education, programs for job training and placement, as well as programs for housing. This was part of what he called the quote unquote war on poverty. Within just a few years, many of these programs and the whole ideology behind them had come under attack. At the core of the debate about poverty in America is the question of whether poverty is the cause of social ills such as crime, poor educational outcomes, and divorce or their result. Perverse incentives are reward structures that lead to suboptimal outcomes by stimulating counterproductive behavior. Unintended consequences are results of a policy that were not fully anticipated at the time the policy was implemented, particularly outcomes that are counter to the intentions of the policy makers. So during a recession, poverty rates may be higher. A recession is a period of economic decline lasting half a year or more. The last time that we were in a recession was right after the 2008 housing market crashed. This here, what you see on figure 10.1, is the number in poverty versus poverty rates from 1960 to 2016. What's interesting to note is that this is how America looks at the official poverty rate and the total number of quote unquote officially poor Americans. And this has varied over a period of five decades. So what do we see here? Well, we see that Every time the Census Bureau and uh, statistics redesigns income questions in its current population survey, the data is used to create this figure. This then also generates what the annual household income at the poverty line would be. That poverty line typically increases by approximately two and a half to three percent annually as the price of goods and services increase. This is called the living wage expense. The next section of our book looks at the culture of poverty. The culture of poverty theory argues that poor people adopt certain practices which differ from those middle class or quote unquote mainstream society in order to adapt and survive in difficult economic circumstances. And that sometimes they continue to rely on these practices even after they are no longer useful and are potentially detrimental. The culture of poverty theory was part of a backlash against the policies implemented by President Johnson in the 60s, and it was used to bolster the arguments of welfare critics. While it may be true that reliance on welfare generates a sense of helplessness and dependency in some people, there are also structural reasons why it can be difficult to transition from welfare to work. So in the 1980s, there was a journalist named Ken Aletta, and he introduced the concept of what is called the underclass. This is a much more negative view of poor people. And Charles Murray re-emphasized perverse incentives. Again, these are reward structures that lead to suboptimal outcomes by stimulating counterproductive behavior. Charles Murray re-emphasized these perverse incentives by arguing that welfare regulations make worse make work, excuse me, and marriage less attractive and rising welfare benefits more attractive. Sociologist William Julius Wilson turned the focus from welfare to factors such as deindustrialization, globalization, suburbanization, and discrimination as causes of urban poverty. In the last 20 to 30 years, policies to combat Poverty have focused on encouraging work and offering benefits that directly serve children, often failing adults. There's another sociologist named Susan Mayer, and she wrote a book 
What Money Can't Buy. This book, which was originally published in 1997, was essentially her perspective on what has happened on how parental income impacts children's outcome. And she found that there's very little evidence to support this widely held belief that parental income has a significant effect on children's outcomes. So a lot of the um, information that William Julius Wilson had talked about with you know, all the reasons behind this and that all these programs are focusing on children that, you know, it's, and especially very sociologists of the 80s saying that even though we focus so much on children programming and providing assistance, we need to really focus more on the adults. Sociologist Susan Mayer said, nope, it's not really necessarily the case that children don't necessarily know they are poor unless these children who are part of the poverty class enter into the quote unquote more mainstream middle class. James Rosenbaum's study of, oh, before we even go there, then let's talk about, again, Charles Murray and Richard Herrnstein. They wrote a book called The Bell Curve. Originally published in 1994, The Bell Curve essentially looks at how Murray and Heinstein argue that it's not necessarily poverty or education or parenting that ultimately has the most impact on children's outcomes, but that really it's based on genetics. So while there are sociocultural facets that Murray had talked about that influence children, Murray and Herrnstein said that it's more biologically based. So it leads us to consider when we are thinking about poverty, what is the impact of nature versus nurture? James Rosenbaum studied the Gatro Assisted Living Program in Chicago and the Moving to Opportunity or MTO study, which began by the US Department of Housing and Urban Development in 94. Both were efforts to see how moving families from high poverty to low poverty communities might affect parental employment, children's outcomes, and a host of other factors. For various reasons, the results of these studies were mixed. But the MTO, or again, the Moving to Opportunity program, in particular, seemed to show that living in a quieter, less stressful environment did have very positive effects on children. The next section of our book looks at poverty amid plenty. So there's this notion of, po of being poor or in poverty, and then absolute poverty. This is the point at which a household's income falls below the necessary level to purchase food to physically sustain its members. The official poverty line in the United States is calculated using a formula developed in the 60s by a woman named Molly Orshansky. This formula estimates food costs for a variety of family types based on the U.S. Department of Agriculture's recommendations for minimum food requirements and then applies a multiplier. This formulation has not changed since it was introduced, but it has been heavily criticized for not evolving to reflect broad changes in people's circumstances over the last 40 years. Something else to think about too is that it can be problematic because again, the cost of living has increased by at least two and a half to three percent annually according to the United States, but when you look at the price of goods and services, many of them have increased 10, 15, 20, and even more in percentages over this time period. When we look at figure 10.2, or the cost of living in the United States in 2017, something to think about, or just to keep in the back of your mind, that there's this cost of living index, and it compares costs between regions using data on housing, transportation, utilities, healthcare, and groceries. The average score is 100, so states with numbers less than 100 are affordable, and those with, with scores above 100 are more expensive. Well, let's look at New Jersey. New Jersey is 121.9. New York is 132.5. Pennsylvania is 102. So it costs a lot more money to live in New Jersey than it would Pennsylvania, but it costs less to live in New Jersey than it does New York. Something else to think about too, again, 
is that the U.S. poverty threshold is criticized heavily because it doesn't take into account regional variations in the cost of living. So for example, living on $10,000 a year in Mississippi is very different than that in living in New York City. When you look at Mississippi, 85.1 is the cost of living index, and it's in green, meaning that it is more affordable. Yellow is question, you know, moderately affordable. Blue is barely affordable, and red is extremely unaffordable or not affordable at all. A more fundamental criticism of trying to establish this absolute poverty measure is that it's impossible because every measure is relative. Different societies and even different groups within one society define poverty differently. There are dissimilar socially constructed notions of what things in life are absolute necessities. A partial response to this is the use of relative poverty. Relative poverty is a measurement of poverty based on a percentage of the median income in a given location. There are three basic theories about how poverty negatively affects children. One focuses on the material deprivations caused by a family's low socioeconomic status. A second, called the parenting stress hypothesis, focuses on bad parenting practices related to a family's low socioeconomic status. And the third focus on differences between poor parents and high income parents, but without much faith that anything can be done to affect those differences. So why is the United States so different? The United States has a much broader range of inequality. Our rich are much richer than our poor. And this, in the United States, this broad range of inequality is bigger than any other developed nation in the world. Higher poverty rates, occur as a result where there's a larger percentage of the population that is below the poverty line. A number of theories have been advanced as to why the United States is in this unique position among industrialized nations, including the timing of our transition to a free market capitalism by other countries compared to the United States, our decentralized form of government in which states have a lot of power, the history of feudalism in Europe, which may have laid the groundwork for a more paternalistic state and American society ambivalence towards race. Efforts to exclude Blacks and Latinx from mainstream society far into the 20th century, sometimes involving limited social services. And what we see here in figure 10.3 is this international comparison of poverty rates among wealthy countries as of 2015. And something for us to note is that as we are looking at this, we are seeing that the United States is still wealthier than many other countries that are considered developed, yet we are finding very high rates of people who are at or below the poverty line, not far off from Turkey, Costa Rica, and South Africa. So how does this continue to happen? Well, as we just talked about, it could be because of a number of different things. It could be, again, as a result of free market capitalism that we transition to as compared to other countries. It could be our decentralized form of government where states have a lot more power versus the government themselves. It could be the history of feudalism in Europe. It could be because of America's ambivalence towards race. However, it could, it could be other, other things as well, and it could be a combination of all of these things. But no matter what, the fact that about 1% of rich Americans make up, make so much more money than those who are in poverty or absolute poverty is astonishing. And there are things that we need to think about in order to look at how we can try to balance out a free market capitalist society while still helping people who are often marginalized to not continue to be marginalized. In the comment section below, I would love to know from you if you could change one thing to help minimize or eradicate poverty, what would you suggest? 
leave your comment in the description box below and you'll get one point added to your final grade. Again, I hope that you have a great day. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to reach out to me. Make sure that you are being kind to yourself and to others, and also to work smarter, not harder. Until next time, have a great one, y'all.